Thank you, Fiona, um, for the uh, great introduction uh, and for hosting such a wonderful uh, and insightful panel uh, on election security. I, I can't imagine uh, a better, more informative discussion uh, carried out by such uh, incredible colleagues. Um, and I'd echo, you know, for our viewers at home, I'd, I'd echo uh, their call uh, that you all become as, as uh, informed and active in ensuring our elections go as smoothly as possible. Um, as Fiona mentioned, we're, we're now going to build on the conversation that uh, our prior colleagues had by focusing not just on the security of the ballot box and American electoral infrastructure, uh, but also by focusing on the uh, information environment writ large, uh, particularly with respect to disinformation uh, and influence operations. So we're going to be uh, looking, as Chris Kebs put it, you know, not just at uh, uh, our infrastructure, but at American minds and how we need to secure those. Um, as part of that conversation, we're thrilled uh, to be joined uh, this afternoon by three amazing colleagues. Uh, the first of them is Lauren Rose, Laura Rosenberger, uh, who is a senior fellow at the German Marshall Fund and director of the Alliance for Securing Democracy, uh, and previously served uh, in a variety of roles in the State Department and National Security Council. Uh, she is by far one of the sharpest minds I know of in the disinformation and influence operations space, and we are uh, delighted to have her joining us this afternoon. Um, Second, uh, we also have David Agranovich joining us. David is a uh, global threat detection lead at Facebook, uh, where he works on disinformation and related threats, um, and previously served as director for intelligence on the National Security uh, uh, Council. And again, we're, we're delighted to have him with us today to share some of his expertise uh, and experience. Uh, and last but not least, we have Alina Polyakova, who is currently the president and CEO of the Center for European Policy Analysis, or CEPA. Um, but previously uh, was a wonderful um, fellow colleague here at Brookings where she was a scholar in our foreign policy program uh, and led our global work on disinformation. So uh, uh, welcome back home, Alina. It is a pleasure uh, to have you with us again. Um, without further ado, I think we can just kind of go ahead and dive in. Uh, and I wanna start with some level setting on what exactly, uh, you know, why disinformation is so important, uh, why, what got us to this point. Um, and Alina, since you were one of the first uh, analysts to really start flagging Russian disinformation, you know, even, even as far back as 2014, 2015, um, I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about you know, what alerted you to the role of, of Russian disinformation campaigns originally, and then kind of what happened uh, in 2016 and 2018 that kind of led us to the point we're at now. Well, thanks so much, Chris. And um, it's wonderful to be at least in this virtual panel and to see all of you. Um, and to see some former uh, familiar faces, uh, former colleagues from Brookings as well. Um, so uh, just to get directly to your question, well, for me, you asked about why um, I cared, I suppose, when no one else did back in 2014. Obviously, most Americans only woke up to the problem of disinformation broadly in the context of our elections in 2016 with and now the very well known Russian activities on social media um, and elsewhere, which are again in the news just this week. And I hope we get to talk about uh, the recent uh, reported uh, cyber attack that the Russian uh, GRU unit, APT 29, the exact same unit that was involved in the hack and dump operation in 2016 was involved in. Um, so they're still uh, at it, so to say. Um, I think it'd be interesting to talk about the reasons for that. But, you know, taking back the clock a little bit, six years, you know, what was happening in 2014, as some of you may remember, is, of course, the revolution in Ukraine. And at that time, I had, was living in Europe and I had spent a lot of time uh, working on Ukraine uh, for research purposes. And I started to notice uh, a sort of skewed narrative emerge in the English language media and what was happening in Ukraine on the ground. Um, and, and, I was on the ground, so I knew what was the reality and what was being reported was something very different. Um, and what was uh, really kind of seeping into even the top uh, US language media at the time uh, were you know, really uh, misinformed uh, narratives around uh, this idea that what was happening in Ukraine was not a democratic revolution, uh, but was actually some sort of fascist coup. And that, of course, was something that was very familiar to me. It was the typical a Kremlin media narrative. And I was really surprised to see it being reproduced in some forms in English language and uh, also uh, German language media at the time. And that's when I first got the sense that Russian propaganda, which is what we called it back then, um, was uh, a bigger issue than I had thought. At the time I thought it was really just an issue having to do with Ukraine. 
certainly frontline states like Ukraine, uh, like Georgia, like Estonia, Lithuania, and Latvia um, have been the targets of Russian propaganda or disinformation for a very long time. And we're pretty familiar with it, knew how to deal with it to a certain extent. But what was new was that these narratives were now appearing and seeping into kind of the main, the mainstream English language media. And that's when I thought this is a real problem when you need to think about it. But then uh, quickly I realized that in DC, uh, this really was not anywhere on the radar of policymakers because I think we tend to think that what happens somewhere over there in Eastern Europe is going to stay somewhere over there in Eastern Europe. So by the time 2016 rolled around, uh, those of us who had spent time looking at what the Russians had been doing in Ukraine, um, I can't say that I wasn't surprised. I was absolutely surprised by the brazen um, nature of the influence operations uh, that the Russians carried out in 2016, but not by the tactics. The tactics were very similar uh, to what we had seen the Russians basically test in Ukraine previously. Um, and all of that really came to the United States in 2016 and then other European countries after that. And basically around every single event that the Russian uh, government sees as important to itself, every single election now has an influence operation component behind it. And of course now in 2020, that's really the reality we're living in. I think it's hard to imagine an election today in which we don't have to be concerned about uh, foreign influence ops. Yeah, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that. I mean, I, I, uh, and flesh out, you know, you, you mentioned the Russian hack earlier, but just what are the, you know, obviously this is a threat that's evolved over time. What are you seeing now as kind of the main trends that, that you know, you're most concerned with, uh, particularly with Russian disinformation, but you know, even more broadly? I think my biggest concern now, um, as someone who has worked on, on Russia for a long time, is actually not Russia. <laughs> Um, and what I mean by that is, of course, now um, this toolkit, the broader influence toolkit that spans beyond uh, the information environment um, has been out there for a long time. And because there hasn't been a focused strategic response uh, to counter and deter these kinds of operations, other states have already been using this toolkit in various ways. And I'm sure David will talk about that. Um, from the perspective of some of the work that Facebook has been doing to take down some of these uh, state-sponsored influence ops. Uh, but even beyond that, you know, my concern is that, you know, we haven't even dealt with the Russia problem. And now we have obviously the China problem and Laura will want to talk about that. Um, and uh, Iran and North Korea and basically any actor or non-state actor as well um, that has some sort of stake or has a, a profit uh, driving incentive uh, to be involved in a in an event that has a lot of eyeballs on it. Elections tend to be these high attention events, which is why there's such incredible opportunities uh, for state actors to have political agendas, or even for non-state actors to have you know profit or economic agendas. So my my biggest concern is that we've seen a profound evolution of the tactics, because as we have identified and exposed how these operations work, especially on social media, the adversaries have adapted. And what we'll, well, we've seen, at least from uh, the Russian activities in some countries in Africa and also in Eastern Europe, is that they're getting much better obfuscating their origins. So in 2016, in a way, it was an easier place to attribute and identify these campaigns because as most people recall, they were being run straight out of St. Petersburg at the time. The so-called troll factor, the IRA, was based there. Um, that gave uh, a very powerful kind of data point to be able to attribute that this was a foreign influence ops when you can easily trace back some of these accounts on Twitter or Facebook where they were originating. And, and now we know that uh, what the Russians have been testing in other parts of the world um, has been kind of blending in with domestic voices, franchising out some of these operations to local actors. Um, and this kind of information warfare by proxy is much more difficult for us to identify and expose. Um, and I'll, I think that's just one of the vectors, to be honest with you. Um, I think the other one that I would not be surprised is already happening, but it's very difficult to know if it's happening, um, is that, of course, infiltration of community groups, whether it be on Facebook, on Instagram, um, and other social media. Um, and the fact that we don't have much insight into what's happening on non-American platforms. 
Of course, TikTok comes top of mind um, and we don't have any insight um, into what's happening in, on TikTok on the disinformation front because they're not subject to the same kinds of transparency um, uh, values and principles that I think are very much embedded in um, Western uh, companies and the kinds of pressures Western companies also face to be more committed to those values and principles. So I think the space has become much more complex. There's a lot more ways to obfuscate, to get around detection, which makes it much more difficult to identify. And it's just a much busier environment and we've never fully dealt with the original bad actor. And now we have dozens of bad actors to deal with. Thanks, Elena. I think you raised about a dozen points that I want to come back to uh, through the course of this conversation. Um, but the, the two I want to pick up just immediately are, you know, you referenced China a few times and you also mentioned this kind of information asymmetric war, you know, uh, kind of space. And I know, Laura, you've been doing a tremendous amount of writing on both those topics. And so I was wondering if you could just kind of give, you know, a, a, your sense of what's happening, you know, what are you seeing with China in particular? Um, and you know, why is it important within this, you know, most Ameri you know, most Americans certainly, I think many of our viewers probably think of disinformation and influence operations as a Russian issue, but clearly it's, it's broader than that now. And so I, I'd be curious for your thoughts on that. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, and thanks, Alina, for, for teeing up some of those right, uh, right there for me. Um, so, you know, the way I think about China and frankly, Russia, um, in terms of what they're doing with disinformation and information manipulation more broadly, and I'm going to use that term primarily as I talk about these tactics, because I think it gets at the broader subset or the broader set of what we often mean when we say disinformation, which is a subset of information manipulation. Um, to me, information manipulation is today a tool um, that Beijing and Moscow and authoritarian regimes in particular see as a means of influencing state power. They see it as a legitimate tool of power and influence and one that as you note is, and as Alina noted, is asymmetrically advantageous to them. In authoritarian regimes, control and manipulation of information is sort of baked into the cake of what they do, right? Um, these regimes are afraid of information if it's free and in the hands of people. They see it as something that is for government to control, and they see it as something that they can weaponize to their own advantage. And Moscow, as Alina um, outlined, you know, has really, um, you know, advanced the the tactics to do that um, on a broad scale in a way that weakens and undermines democracy. And of course, while their most recent um, your social media kinds of operations have a particular scope and scale. There's a long history to Russia's use of these kinds of tactics, even going back to the Cold War. What we've seen with China has been a little bit different. Um, so if we were having this conversation a year ago, I would have told you that China's tactics uh, when it comes to information manipulation looked pretty different than Russia's. That China's goal was largely aimed at promoting a positive image of the People's Republic of China and the Chinese Communist Party. That amplify, creating and amplifying positive narratives about China and suppressing unwanted narratives, as well as suppressing like, people and organizations they didn't want to have a voice, that those were the main tactics that we saw China using. And that most of their information manipulation really had to do with things that were about China which is pretty distinct from what we see from Russia in terms of its info manipulation. It's not trying to sell itself to the world. China as a, an objectively rising power is. And so the information piece was a big part of that strategy. Interestingly, what we've seen over the past year, really starting about last August with the height of the Hong Kong protests last summer, accelerating during COVID, um, has been a turn in a far more aggressive direction um, by PRC state and state affiliated actors in the information space. So a couple of the pieces that I think are indicative of this. The first is um, that we've seen, uh, you know, a lot of what people have called the wolf warrior tactics. Um, these uh, Chinese um, official uh, spokespeople from the foreign ministry, as well as from their state media outlets, really aggressively um, engaging in almost troll-like behavior on Twitter, much like we see Russian officials often doing, right? The kind of stuff that goes viral and, and gets lots of clicks and gets you big followings. Um, we've seen a whole lot of that in a very negative, negative direction. 
A lot of that, again, has been around COVID, but we've seen that also begin to happen around the, the protests about George Floyd and, and um, police brutality and racism in the U.S. Um, but we've also seen, I think, um, you know, the, the, the development and greater use of, of actual disinformation, of, of deliberately false information, particularly around COVID-19. And I would say this was largely about a couple of things. One is deflecting blame from the Chinese Communist Party for its own failings in response to the virus initially. Um, but the second was really to sow confusion and doubt about the origin of the virus. When we saw multiple conflicting narratives being spread by PRC state um, officials, um, state media, um, as well as amplified through some covert networks, it looked very similar to what we saw the Russians do after the MH17 shoot down and the poisoning of Sergei Skripal. Um, now, did they say, Let, let's look at that playbook and let's sort of recreate it ourselves? Who knows? But there were a whole lot of similarities there. And it was really the first time that we saw um, official Chinese actors engaging in this kind of, um, let's sow confusion, doubt, and chaos tactic. The other thing I think is notable about what China's doing um, to sort of pan back out to this geostrategic lens, which I think is important, is a lot of their content is really aimed at discrediting democracy, which sounds very similar, in fact, to what we see from Russia, right? And so around the George Floyd protests, a lot of what we've seen has been really interesting commentary, like, look at this chaos in the U.S., um, democracy is a mess. Well, of course, the truth of the matter is protests are the sign um, of a democracy that is working through the process of addressing its own challenges, right? Um, but, and it's sort of a misunderstanding there, I would say, on the parts of, of Chinese officials on, on sort of the significance of protests in, in a democracy. But that's been the narrative they, they've tried to push. Similarly, um, you know, we, we've actually seen just earlier this week, one of the Chinese foreign ministry spokespeople, Hua Chunying, tweeted, um, you know, isn't it crazy? I can't remember her exact wording, but basically like, gee, the U.S. has two 70-year-olds um, who are running for president. This is a failing of democracy. Democracy sucks. Like that was the basic tagline of her tweet, right? This is a wholly new kind of tactic from Chinese officials that's not about China, that's about discrediting the U.S., that's about discrediting democracy, and it's using that weaponized information platform to do so. The last thing I would say, back to your question on the asymmetries here, is that I think it's really important, and I know today we'll probably talk about, you know, keep, we only have so much time, so we'll, we'll sort of have a limited scope conversation, but I think it's really important in particular to understand from what China is doing, that I believe its use of information manipulation is not just about that tactic itself, it's about advancing and creating a, a separate, a, a different information model distinct from what democracies have, that's free and open flows. The information model that Beijing is trying to advance is one that has sovereignty at the center, that believes that states should be able to inspect data as it's transiting systems, that believes that it should be able to censor content. And they're trying to export those things around the world. And they do that in terms of infrastructure, and they also do that in terms of governance of information. So the information manipulation tactics are part of this broader strategy. And I think that it's important as we think about what we do about these challenges to, to think about them in an integrated way. Thanks, Laura. That's incredibly helpful. And I, I think one, um, we, I want to come back to that point about uh, information and democracies versus, uh, uh, you know, authoritarian regimes like we see in China. Um, I do want to just quickly follow up on a point Alina made about kind of platform governance on foreign owned uh, uh, social media platforms like TikTok, which has obviously been in the news a lot lately. Is that also something that you see as kind of part of China's effort? Or do you think that that's kind of a, a private company and a, a you know, in the U.S., we would kind of separate out the private sector from the government. Um, do you see that? How do you see that relationship within the Chinese context? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, I, I think that the um, Chinese export of its indigenous platforms is going to be an increasingly big part of the conversation that we're seeing here. And when I talk about that infrastructure aspect, that's absolutely the kind of thing I'm, I'm getting at. Um, you know, when it comes to TikTok, TikTok's doing its best um, to attempt to argue that it is, um, you know, wholly independent uh, from the from the Chinese government. Um, you know, we can have a long conversation about what state capitalism means in China, um, the laws governing um, access to data, as well as the fact that, you know, every, 
all organizations over a certain size have to have not only um, a government cell, but a party cell within their companies. You know, the, you can, we can go down the list of the ways in which independent company, private company means a very different thing in the China context. On TikTok, you know, there's been a lot of hyperventilating lately. And I think that some of the commentary has sort of missed the point, um, which is, I think, a couple of things. One is, as Alina said, we don't really have uh, a transparent sense of what's happening. I mean, TikTok did release a transparency report um, for whatever that is, is worth, but without, um, you know, an ability to have greater insight in a lot of different ways, um, we really don't have an understanding of what's happening there. The data collection pieces, I, I think, have gotten misunderstood a little bit. I, I don't, you know, um, Facebook and Google are, are massive surveillance collection systems for data. Um, and, and I have concerns about that too. Um, but there is a distinction there between the way in which those are private companies that don't have the ability to imprison and in some cases, you know, physically or otherwise abuse their citizens. Um, and, and in China, that is the reality. And so there's a really big distinction there, I think, number one. Um, number two um, is that, you know, I, I remember for having conversations with, with, with people about TikTok a couple of years ago, and people were like, what's the problem? It's just a video sharing thing. It's just fun. Um, there's no politics on there. Like, it doesn't matter in the political sense. And my point was all of these platforms, especially when they grow to a particular size, take on new applications, take on new uses. And we've absolutely seen that be the case with TikTok. There's no reason it would have been the exception to the rule. And so I do have deep concerns with the way in which, you know, TikTok's um, platform is, is purely algorithmically driven, right? And it is a total black box to us, what's being surfaced, what's being promoted, what's not even appearing on the platform, right? It's not even a question of like takedowns in the way we think about it in a Facebook sense. Um, algorithmic suppression we know is something that China has used internally, that it uses on platforms like WeChat and Weibo. Um, so we would have to assume it's the same thing here. Now, the quandary for me, as I've written about, is doing things like banning platforms or, or denying access um, to certain kinds of things also feels um, not only undemocratic in certain instances, but like at the end of the day, it, it creates the sort of information reality that our adversaries might want um, in terms of, you know, basically creating two separate information universes, um, one of which is for the closed platforms and one of which is not. That may be where we're headed. Um, and we may need to have um, really deep discussions about, about how we manage that. But I think that needs to be a, a very strategic, broad conversation, not about individual whack-a-mole platforms, but frankly, how we as democracies are going to build an information model that promotes the kind of information society that we want to live in and that affirms democracy. And that needs to be done holistically, not just in um, deciding on, on individual bans. Now, again, when there are true national security implications, um, as we've seen with a couple of particular, um, you know, other Chinese companies and things like that, then I think that that yes, we we can we can definitely take action on those things. But in general, I worry that across the slate of these issues, we tend to take action on individual pieces of the puzzle rather than thinking about the solution to the puzzle from the, you know, from the big picture perspective. That's great. And I, I want to uh, come back to you later. Uh, I know you just wrote a paper as well on the, kind of the idea of a democratic model for our information ecosystem. I want to definitely pick up on that thread uh, in a bit. Uh, first, though, I want to turn it uh, over to David. And, um, you know, we've heard a lot about some of the trends that Laura and Alina have been kind of noticing uh, in the disinformation space, particularly with respect to Russia and China, but also even in terms of tactics, right? Like it, it's harder to attribute, you know, um, uh, disinformation campaigns now, it's harder to identify them in some ways. Um, you know, what, what are the trends that you all are seeing? Did, did what uh, uh, Laura and Alina kind of reference, did that resonate with you and what you're seeing at Facebook? Um, uh, and, you know, if you can talk about that and just, you know, what the trends are that you're seeing right now, that'd be great. Definitely, and, and thanks, Chris, for the opportunity to join this conversation. Um, it's a really, really timely time to talk through all of this, this stuff. Um, just maybe to level set, my team focuses on both the coordination of our in investigations and disruptions of these types of operations on Facebook, as well as thinking through some of the scenario planning around what new tactics do we anticipate seeing 
as these operations evolve and adapt to the enforcement that's being taken against them on different platforms. Um, so a really timely question, and, and I appreciate it. I think Alina and Laura touched on some of the tactics that we are starting to see uh, out in the wild on, on Facebook and, and across these operations. So the first um, thing I wanted to call out is this conversation, uh, even when I was still in government back in 2016, 2017 period, focused really heavily on foreign interference because that was you know, the 2016 elections had just happened and, and public attention was focused on the Internet Research Agency and, and to a lesser extent, the, I'd argue, potentially even more impactful GRU activities targeting um, the, the DNC and the Podesta emails. But as we've conducted um, our enforcement actions over the last several years at Facebook, about half of the operations we see using these types of deceptive tactics um, are domestic in nature. So the, they originate uh, within the country where they're targeting and they're operated by individuals who are in that country who understand the language, understand the culture. Um, and so what that has done is it's created an interesting um, challenge. Our policies on the Facebook side are foreign domestic agnostic, right? So we enforce on both pretty much equally if they're using the same domestic tactics, but the conversation around how we should approach this issue legally or legislatively, or even from a national security perspective is oftentimes bracketed into that foreign conversation. So there, there's a bit more to talk through on the domestic front. We're seeing that uh, trend increase uh, as time goes on. We announced, I think it was last week, four takedowns from around the world, one of which was in the United States. All four of those operations had strong domestic ties. I mean, we're primarily domestic operations. Um, the second trend that we've been seeing is, as Alina noted, the operational security uh, of these networks has improved considerably. Some of that, I'm sure, is just because as we and other platforms and other entities in government take more aggressive actions to expose these operations, they learn from the ways that we're discovering them. Um, there's an interesting uh, parallel to this, though, which is that as these operations have become more effective at hiding, it also seems to complicate their ability to reach as broad of an audience because they're spending a lot of time hiding from us, which means it's hard to be loud and reach a bigger group of people. Uh, a corollary to that is the fact that in addition to becoming better at hiding their activity on any specific platform, they've distributed activity across multiple platforms and increasingly to off-platform websites. Um, so in many cases, you know, 2016, 2017 is relatively straightforward to take down a network of accounts on Facebook. And in doing so, the content that they posted goes away, the pages that they run go away. Um, but now these operations leverage websites that they've registered with a domain registrar. And so even if you remove the, fa the Facebook or social media side of the operation, some part of it persists in the wild. Um, and I, I think both, both Alina and Laura mentioned this, but we also see an increased reliance on, on authentic communities and proxies to enable these types of operations. Um, the, most, uh, the best example of this was the effort by the, what we assess to be the IRA to use a network based in Ghana to target the United States, um, both to hide the IRA's role in the operation, but also just to give them one more step to try and obscure what was really happening there. Um, and then the last piece I wanted to touch on uh, from, a, from a trends perspective, um, we saw this happen in the 2018 midterm elections. And, and I think Mark, Mark Harvey on the last panel noted that one of the goals of many of these operations is to undermine public confidence in the election itself, to undermine public confidence in democratic systems and institutions. Um, and we saw an operation in 2018 where the goal was to get people to believe that our political system, political discourse online uh, and the media was wholly uh, controlled by, undermined by Russian actors. Um, there's a bunch of really interesting case studies that have been written on that front. We call this perception hacking uh, internally. And what, what the challenge that it presents both to us as a platform and to our partners in industry and in government is to counter claims of widespread interference, um, you have to be transparent, which is one of the reasons why we publicize all of our takedowns but you also have to have built the partnerships and the connective tissue between civil society, experts like Elena and Laura, teams like ours, so that when there are extraordinary claims like what we saw in November of 2018, that you know, the Russians had undermined all of our uh, public communications, that we can push back on that um, and help clarify with the evidence that we have what's actually happening. Uh, so I'll pause there, uh, but those are some of the main trends that we've been seeing in the wild process operations. Thanks, David. That was great. I know, uh, Alina, you've got a quick two-finger that you wanted to raise. 
Yeah, and just wanted to put uh, kind of a pin in what uh, David just said about uh, one of the sort of evolution vectors of these kinds of operations, and that is that this kind of ecosystem approach, the cross-platform, cross-online entity coordination that we're seeing. And I think this also highlights the issue that Laura raised that on the other side, meaning on the platform side, or even on the broader internet <laughs> environment side, we're not seeing the same kind of coordinated response. Um, so while the actors, the malicious actors or whatever you want to call state actors, not state actors carrying out uh, information influence ops are increasingly you know, spreading in this wide net where you see activities and content reverberating across, whether it be websites, YouTube, you know, Instagram, um, Medium, and even some of these other more subversive um, uh, so parts of the internet like Reddit or Gab, right? Um, we're not seeing that kind of coordination to respond to those attacks. And to the extent to which that's not really possible is something that we should discuss. But I think one way that comes out is in the kinds of policies we've seen uh, the various platforms launch when it comes to content controls, where we see a lot of differences in how uh, platforms are responding to misleading or false information, especially we've seen this around public health misinformation. And so some content that is prohibited on like Twitter is not prohibited on Facebook or somewhere else. And I think that allows those kinds of loopholes allow for um, you know, these continued kinds of operations to be carried out, even if we're responding in all these other ways. Thanks, Alina. I think that's kind of a, a natural segue to where I want to kind of steer the conversation next a little bit, which is not just what's going on, but what to do about it, right? Uh, and I think one of the natural starting points, I do want to get to the policy side of this question, but, um, and the government side, but, um, you know, David, I, I think you raised the issue of this being a cross-platform issue. Yeah. Um, so I'd, I'd be curious to hear more about your thoughts on what Facebook is doing or what the, the sector as a whole needs to do um, to, to address this. And then, you know, obviously anything that Facebook internally is doing um, and, and kind of uh, addressing the issue of disinformation on their platform and trying to remediate and secure the information environment. Uh, we'd be, uh, if, you, if you can speak to that a bit, that'd be great. Yeah, of course. Um, so I think the there's a four main ways that we've tried to address the, the trends that I had mentioned at the top. Um, and the first is, um, kind of to Alina's point on, on content-based enforcement being challenging, we've deliberately scoped our policies to focus on a specific set of deceptive behaviors. And so the goal there is to say, look, it doesn't matter who you are. Um, even if we can't necessarily attribute you to a specific individual or group, um, if you're engaged in this core set of deceptive behaviors, then there's enough there for us to take an enforcement action. Um, that addresses two of the challenges, right? It addresses the foreign domestic problem because it's agnostic to the location of the actor. And it addresses the challenge around attribution becoming harder um, because it doesn't mean we have to say that this is the IRA or this is Iran, but rather if, if it's a network that is misleading about aspects of their activity, then we can take some sort of an action. Um, the second piece is frankly, you know, to the cross-platform nature of many of these operations, building partnerships and information sharing throughout the industry is an important uh, pillar of the work that we do to counter these types of operations. Um, and so there have been a couple of examples. Um, perhaps the best one is some of our enforcement across Iranian operations, where we might find an operation or one of our partners in industry finds an operation, shares information about that network with us, or we'll share with them. And then you'll see another takedown come from that platform a week later or a day later, sometimes at the exact same time. Um, that type of uh, virtuous cycle of information sharing, whether it's within industry or with partners in government and civil society, can help us kind of get our arms around what's becoming increasingly a multi-platform, multi-societal sector threat. Um, and then the, the last piece I wanted to hit on was kind of a deterrence and resilience approach. Um, one of the benefits, so when I was in government, right, our tools to deal with these types of operations were legislative change um, or kind of the, the traditional levers of state power. Right? You can uh, indict some people, sanction some people, um, but ultimately we were responding um, to a battle space we didn't control. One of the benefits that we have at a platform like Facebook is because the, the challenge is occurring on our platform, we can change aspects of the platform to make the operations less effective. 
Um, so we think about this as if we see an operation that's leveraging an aspect of the platform to hide themselves more effectively or to reach people more effectively, to think through ways we can change the product to introduce friction. So our admin location transparency. So when your page gets over a certain size, the location of your admins becomes public. Um, yeah, it has, has a bunch of other benefits outside of the influence operations space. One of the benefits in this space is it forces you to either become revealed that you're actually located in country A and not country B, or to take a bunch of steps to build the type of infrastructure you would need in order to consistently hide from us where you're actually located, which may in its own right raise other signals of badness. And then the second part of that approach to deterrence and resilience is working both on the platform to build more resilience with users, right? Show people more information about what they're interacting with and working with partners to help build resilience in broader society. The last example I wanted to note was kind of a, maybe it illustrates really well where we've come from 2017 until now, we being the broader community that work on these campaigns. Um, Alina, I think at the outset mentioned secondary infection, um, a, this operation that the British government just mentioned was potentially linked to some of the trade leaks during the election. Um, in May, I think it was of 2019, uh, our investigative teams were the first uh, folks in the space to uncover secondary infection and publicly discuss the fact that it existed. Um, and when we did that, what was interesting was it was a completely different operation than the things we had seen in 2016 and 2017. In the 2016, 2017 period, the goal was like this broad audience to create personas designed to like directly interact with users. In the May 2019 period, you had an operation that was far more sophisticated in its operational security, was far more disseminated across multiple platforms, and whose goal seemed to be much more about kind of this amplification of targeted leak information or forged uh, documents or doctored tweets or what have you, depending on the time uh, that we're looking at. The secondary infection disclosures that we made were specific to activity on Facebook and some stuff that happened on some other platforms. Where things really became an effective response was when we had shared information with some of our partners at Graphica, a social, a social media research firm based in New York, that does excellent work on a variety of different threat actors, who then were able to take what we had shared with them and turn in, it into an investigation that's now spanned over a year, that's resulted in a, a several different rounds of disclosures on their part. They, I think, have identified over 300 websites and platforms that the secondary infection operators were active on. Um, and then we're able to kind of pull the, the curtain back on this activity across the entire ecosystem. So I think that that combination of public disclosures, um, deep investigations on platforms to uncover what would otherwise not be visible publicly, and then partnerships with researchers and civil society to pull all of these threads together from multiple platforms, that gets us to a place where we can really get our arms around some of these complex operations. Thanks, David. Uh, Laura, I want to uh, turn to you. Um, I think David just described a bit about what Facebook is doing on its platform um, and what some of the kind of information sharing that's happening within the private sector. Um, and I'd love, you know, if you have thoughts on uh, or responses to what David said, it'd be great uh, to hear those. But also, I'd also be curious for your thoughts on the limitations of kind of uh, self-regulation or co-regulation and what needs to happen from a policy perspective to get better purchase on this issue. Yeah, thanks, Chris, and, and thanks, David. Um, so I think a couple of the pieces that, that David put on the table are important from a government perspective as well. Um, you know, he, in a few of the different pieces he laid out there, information sharing um, came up, whether that's sharing um, across platforms, whether that's sharing with researchers, but also um, I think, you know, the, the piece of um, sharing information with government, especially when it comes to foreign actors, is really important. I mean, um, government um, uh, entities have unique visibility into the activity um, of some of our, our adversaries um, in cyberspace um, and the ability to share um, certain kinds of signatures and information with platforms to be able to, to look into that information and, and what may be happening on their platforms can be really important in, in terms of um, uh, providing leads um, and, and sort of um, starting to know where to look. Um, you know, I, I think one of the things that strikes me in this space is that, um, you know, my own view is that I actually don't think outside of limited areas, we want governments um, rooting around on social media 
um, to, to monitor what's happening. I mean, there are spaces where that is appropriate, but largely within the US um, domestically, and particularly when it comes to really sensitive things like political issues, um, that is not a space where I think it's appropriate or good for democracy to have government monitoring. But at the end of the day, that's going to require government and the platforms bringing together different kinds of information about what platforms know are happening on their systems and what government is seeing happening from foreign actors. Now, that's not going to get at your domestic piece, and, and I grant that. But on the foreign side, I think this is really, really important. And we've made progress on that front. Um, it was one of the biggest um, challenges and complaints on both sides after 2016. Um, there's been substantial progress on that front. Um, I think, unfortunately, in my view, a lot of that sharing remains very ad hoc. Um, and it's through various informal channels. And um, I have concerns about the sustainability of that. And I have concerns, frankly, about some of the protections that I think need to be written into information sharing mechanisms, protections for privacy, protections for speech, protections for classified information, right? Um, and so I, I think that seeing a more formalized and robust way of sharing information between the government and the private sector also has to be a part of this. Uh, on the question of, of self-regulation or co-regulation, um, I think the regulatory conversation has gotten really bollocked up um, and, and unhelpfully by um, you know, political conversations about um, whether platforms are biased in one political direction, whether platforms are silencing or censoring certain kind of people, um, or, you know, and then there's the, the broad question about, um, you know, 230 and what's happening with that or breaking up Facebook. And my own view is that all of these are red herrings for the real conversation we need to be having, right? Those are not the kind of regulation that I think the vast majority of us in this space are actually talking about. And so we're having arguments about these kinds of regulatory frameworks that are not what anybody who's actually an expert on these issues is recommending. What I do think we need to be doing starts actually with, if we talk about sort of the guts of the system, right? Um, it, I think we need to actually start out talking about data as the first point here. And if we look frankly at, um, at, at how, again, the, the differences between a democratic model and the authoritarian model, a lot of it comes down to data and who gets access to it and what happens with it and how we think about that. And in democracies, you know, certainly in the U.S., we've had a very hands-off approach to data. You know, the, the EU obviously has led in this space with GDPR. In my view, GDPR is not perfect. It's providing a roadmap, though, for certain states that are seeking to take some action here. But the conversations we need to be happening go that need to be happening go way beyond just data protection as it's laid out in GDPR. We need to be having substantial conversations about data privacy, data security, data governance, right? I mean, the ruling um, out of the EU this week on the privacy shield is really significant um, in a space where the US has not actually been engaging substantially. I know that sounds like it's a different conversation from talking, you know, regulating the platforms around disinformation, but actually the data feedback loops that feed virality, that feed into the ad tech ecosystem that promotes so much of this content. Um, that is actually a really big piece of the engine system for surfacing disinformation and, and other kinds of manipulative activity. And so I think that, you know, when it comes to regulation, it's, it's less necessarily about the platforms themselves and regulating their activity, but it's more about thinking, again, back to this earlier point I made, what does a democratic internet look like and how do we build it and what are the pieces of that? And the data piece for me is, is absolutely front and center. It's one right now, frankly, where we could be doing so much more with Europe. Um, we could be really, really working together as democracies um, in a substantial way, and we have been absent. And so I think that that needs to be sort of top of ticket in terms of what we do there. The last thing I'll say is, you know, I could have a, we can have a long conversation on the policy front, but the one thing I do not think should be up for regulation is content. I do not believe that with narrow exceptions, right, like terrorism and, you know, other kinds of violent extremism or, or threats to harm, um, I do not believe that in a democracy, government has a place in regulating content. And the good news here is that when we look at disinformation and the, you know, the majority of the of the challenge that we see actually doesn't relate to the content itself. It's the behavior that accompany, accompanies it. It's the malicious actors spreading it, right? And so there's lots of content neutral ways 
of addressing the broader information manipulation challenge that we see. Now, under 230 and you know existing law, platforms do have a right um, to regulate content and to, and to moderate it, and that is their right. But I do not believe that that is something that we should have democracies beginning to regulate. Thanks, Laura. That ties in uh, pretty well with one of the questions that came up that, that came in about, you know, what kind of, are there any models elsewhere, particularly in Europe, for the kinds of data governance that you're talking about, um, or responses, you know, by democracies more generally to this issue? Um, so, Alina, I'm going to turn it over to you. I mean, are, are there kind of policy, you know, frameworks and uh, that are in line a bit with what Laura described that you're familiar with or that uh, would be useful for countering disinformation? Well, I think Laura's point is just so important because we're talking about disinformation. We started this conversation talking about influence, information influence ops is the preferred term here. Uh, but you, once you actually start to think about what do we do about it, we cannot get away from having a much broader discussion on the digital regulatory agenda. And the I think the problem with looking at specific case studies, so what for example, um, has Germany been doing or France been doing? It's been pretty uneven, I would say. I don't think anyone has come up with the, the golden goose when it comes to a uh, regulatory environment um, and what actually works. And I think the big issue has been that the focus has been on quote unquote illegal content and expanding the definition of that beyond what Laura said, which is you know things that we can all agree should not be appearing in the public domain, like child pornography, uh, extreme violence, terrorism, things of that nature. But most disinformation doesn't fit into that narrow category. But what we've seen from a lot of European countries um, is a desire to push on that specific agenda, to expand the definition of so-called illegal content exactly because the free speech laws that govern most European countries are much are a much less expansive version of free speech than what the First Amendment allows in the United States. And so what I see happening, and you know, Laura's point about working together with other democracies is so critical here, is of course that the digital environment, the internet, is not bound by national borders. So national regulatory frameworks cannot actually address what we're talking about. But the problem with where we are today is that we have these kind of hodgepodge regulations um, and laws coming from all over Europe. Then we have the European Commission uh, the, at the EU level trying to come up with some sort of regulatory agenda um, that will be unveiled by the end of this year, supposedly. And then we have the United States where we have calls here and there for, I think, quite misguided regulatory uh, suggestions like antitrust is going to be the panacea. It won't be. Or, you know, doing away with 230 is going to be the panacea that saves us. It won't be. None of these, you know, silver bullets work because there isn't a silver bullet. But the problem is that, you know, what I see now is this huge rift emerging between Europe and especially where the commission is going, the European Commission and, and regulation, and where the United States is or might go, uh, depending on what happens in November, I think. Um, but we're not coming together and, and having some, uh, a dialogue where we can come to some middle ground or set of understanding about what does a digital agenda that is rooted first and foremost in democratic principles actually look like. And there's lots of ideas out there. They've been out there for years. <laughs> um, Laura's written about this. I've written about this. Many people have written about this. Uh, but it's just not, we're not getting there. And I think um, that is what we really need to be looking toward is how do we actually bring to the table the private sector, the, the civil society uh, space, governments to have input in coming up with a set of um, regulatory agendas. Um, and there are some efforts in the space that I think will have some valuable results like the Paris call effort. But of course the United States isn't part of that. Uh, so that's a big outlier there, um, but there isn't one that includes all of uh, this, all of the stakeholders and all the governments I mentioned. So I, that's a way of maybe punting the question a bit, but I don't want to point to a single example because there really isn't one country is getting it right. There are some countries are getting some things right, um, but 
we haven't seen you know, a really comprehensive approach to this. Thanks, Elena. I think we've got a little bit of time left, but I, and I want to raise one of the questions, and it's in line, I think, with this broader question about democracy and norms around uh, you know, uh, influence operations. One of the things that we've seen this week uh, or learned this week was that the uh, U.S. has kind of, or the Trump administration has authorized um, uh, potential uh, hack and leak operations, which are pretty commonly used within disinformation campaigns. Um, it's certainly been used against the U.S. Um, and I would be curious for your thoughts and comments on whether that's something that, um, you know, there, there's one issue of defending the U.S. against these attacks. There's another issue of us offensively using them. Um, and uh, I'd be curious for any of your thoughts on um, uh, whether or not that's in line with what a democracy should be doing. Alina, I'll go to you first. Just, just very quickly. Um, first of all, I'll just say that maybe it's a, it's a bit of a controversial view, but I do think we need to be on the offensive uh, when it comes to um, countering um, and building resilience against uh, information influence operations. But it doesn't mean that we that being on the offensive means we do what they do to us and we just do it to them. Um, and I think that's what's happening here. It's a relatively narrow view what it means to get on the offensive and we can do lots of different things. One, what we were just talking about is building a coherent front and actually seeing a democratic digital domain as a value, not as something that we have to defend, but as something that is, a uni is universally desired by most people in the world to have free and open public discourse uh, in the online space. And we need to see that as an asset, not something that we're constantly having to kind of uh, defend as like, oh, this is, this is the way to do it. The way that China is doing is not the way to do it. Um, so I actually think the, as often happens with this administration, perhaps the intuition is not the incorrect one, that we need to get ahead of this game, that we need to get um, out of this kind of whack-a-mole approach where we are just reacting to every single influence ops that gets thrown at us. But um, the, the follow through, I think, is not the right one here. Uh, Laura, I want to uh, turn to you now. I know you've written really eloquently and really well about kind of what should or shouldn't be in bounds for democracies to do in this kind of environment. And so I'd, I'd be curious for your thoughts on that, too. Yeah, well, I'll just build off of the point that Alina made there at the end. I mean, my view is, in general, um, across this, as you said, around disinformation and, and some of the questions um, more broadly about, you know, um, cyber tactics is that we have this tendency in these conversations to talk about what it is we're trying to counter um, instead of trying, instead of talking about what it is we're trying to achieve, right? And if what we're trying to achieve is simply the defeat of a different model, which again, in my view, all these tactics are part of a different information model, an authoritarian one that, that our adversaries and competitors are trying to advance. We have to have something affirmative to offer, right? If we're constantly on the defensive, we are, we are, um, we are not necessarily either coming up with something to, to offer, but also, you know, as we mentioned earlier, these are asymmetric tactics. And so definitionally, when we are responding in a symmetric way, um, we are responding in a way that is to our disadvantage. <laughs> and so what we need to do is develop an affirmative agenda for what we actually want to achieve and how do we go about doing that and build from that. And, and that means a couple of things. One, um, we, we absolutely need to put democratic principles front and center in what we do. Not just because it's the right thing from a moral perspective, it is, but not just because of it. Because in this contest between democratic model and an authoritarian model, living our values is strategic. We can't win if we don't live our values. So that's one big piece of it for me. The other piece of it for me is again, given the asymmetries of the tactics themselves, we are never going to win in a hack and leak, you know, face off, right? In the race to the bottom of who's gonna go further and who's gonna play dirtier, it's definitely not us, right? We are going to lose. We also, the way, you know, in particular, if we're talking about China, but also, you know, even with others, you know, we are probably the most exposed in terms of the vulnerability of our digital and internet infrastructure. And so if we start to open this can of worms, we are the ones who are most likely um, to lose here. 
So I had deep concerns if that report from Yahoo News is true about the authorization of hack and leak campaigns. I think it is exactly the wrong kind of thing for us to be doing. Now, to Alina's point, that doesn't mean that nothing offensive is on the table. Um, I mean, you know, I do think that maybe in this space we need to get away from the terminology of offense and defense, offense and defense, because it's not always clear what's what. But I do think that we do need to be not only affirmative, but very assertive. And in one of the papers I recently wrote, um, my colleague actually came up with a, a concept, um, her, Lindsay Gorman, we co-authored a paper together, and she used a parallel um, that we talk about in the maritime space of freedom of navigation operations that we use around um, contested territory. She talked about um, freedom of information operations, where we use truthful information and openness in an offensive way to pierce the closed information veil that our authoritarian competitors are constructing for themselves. And to use information, again, harnessing it with the democratic principles in mind, um, but in that way, not as weaponized, because if we weaponize information, we lose, democracies lose. Um, but we do need to find a way to harness that information in a way that's consistent with democracy. Thanks, Laura. I'm, I'm cognizant that we're almost out of time. So I want to just have one kind of last writing, lightning round, uh, you know, uh, and go around each of you. And if there's one kind of takeaway if for, for our audience that's concerned about disinformation in the lead up to the next election, um, you know, what would you say, uh, you know, to our audience about, you know, either things you're concerned about or things that we should be proactively doing? Uh, Alina, I'll, I'll, I'll start with you. Um, thanks, Chris. Um, so just to clarify, is the question in terms of who's the we in the question, I just wonder, like, is it like we as individuals or we as governments? Well, let, let's just, we haven't talked about it as much. I know we've talked more in the last panel about it. So let's, let's do we as individuals. Um, if, if you do want to do governments, feel free to do so, but let's focus on individuals if, if you'd rather go there. Yeah, I mean, this may so sound a bit cliche, but I do think that um, having a critical eye to information is part of citizens' responsibility. Um, I don't think we can really eschew that given that we live in a digital world where uh, we are overwhelmed with information at all times. And it may seem that um, we're asking people to do too much. And I certainly think that there is a role that governments and the private sector have to play to not put all the burden on the individual to do the hard leg work of figuring out, you know, what is a legitimate uh, story, what is not when they're being delivered a lot of this content via algorithms that they have no control over. Uh, but I do think that, you know, when you're on social media or um, in the case of some members of my family uh, getting on email chains, uh, which we never talk about, but email chains are a huge way that some share misleading content, um, especially perhaps some of my parents' generation, um, that when you receive that content, you know, look at the source before you share it. You know, don't immediately just share something because of a headline. Um, don't immediately assume that it is true because it's online. And I do think that a lot of people don't take that time, gonna take a deep breath before they click or before they click share, before they click like, even if it's coming from your cousin or someone you know, that in itself doesn't mean it's accurate. Um, and just taking a moment to think about, like, does this have a, does this sound kind of sensationalist and tabloidy to me? A lot of this kind of clickbait stuff does. Um, does this conform with things I've heard in the past um, from you know, major outlets? But I think the big issue here that would take us to a very different conversation, that's not really part of, outside the scope of this discussion, is the fact that very much increasingly, we're living in very different realities in our country. Um, and that very much, I think, overlaps with the kind of political polarization, um, the economic inequalities we're seeing, the kind of racial inequalities we're seeing, that you know, people living in one type of community have a completely different interpretation of events than people living in another type of community. Um, and so we tend to not see or not want to believe things that don't conform to our worldview. So I think we could all use a little bit of uh, openness, I think, to understanding others' points of view, even if they may sound really ridiculous to us sometimes. Um, and to have a little bit of patience, and uh, I'm sorry to say it, uh, it sounds a little hippie, uh, but a little bit of kindness for other people 
um, instead of judging them immediately for having maybe holding ideas that we want know not to be true or to strongly disagree with. And I think um, if we just start there, it might, we might go a long way. <laughs> Happiness is always encouraged. Thank you, Alina. Um, uh, uh, David, I'm going to turn to you, and then we'll close with with Laura. Sure. Yeah, I think I think Alina's points are really salient. Um, if there's anything I could add to that, it would be um, to remember that this problem is a whole of society problem. That that isn't to say we don't have a responsibility to get things right at Facebook. We do. We have a huge responsibility to to fix the the mistakes of the past into into like find these operations and remove them, but we have to be thinking about how to build resilience in every part of our society. That means tech companies doing their jobs and keeping things safe on their platforms. It means governments sharing information when they need to and, and, and using the levers of a state to protect their people. It means uh, civil society continuing to hold us all accountable. Um, the other thing I would just uh, maybe emphasize is the importance of, of being really careful about speculation around disinformation or influence operations around elections. I think um, there's a proclivity to jump to the assumption that the person that you're disagreeing with on Twitter is a bot or that the candidate you didn't like won because of a, a troll operation. Um, something that stuck with me ever since before I joined Facebook is a really brilliant uh, influence operations researcher named Alicia Wanless um, at Carnegie now, who wrote a piece about how disinformation is a funhouse mirror held up to society. Um, and it stuck with me because one of the challenges here is that to solve, solve the influence operations problem as best as one can, you have to actually go after the underlying fractures within society that are exploited by these campaigns, right? The, the IRA does not create from whole cloth the divisions that they attempt to exploit. Um, and so the solution here is one in which we do, to, to Alina's point, need to think about how we can, as individuals, as a society, as a community, work to mend some of the, the uh, divides that make us vulnerable to these campaigns. Um, and then maybe the last piece is just that, uh, as Alina mentioned, you know, constant vigilance is incredibly important here, that we're asking, that you're constantly asking questions about where the information you're seeing is coming from, I mean, seeking out more information before, you know, coming to a conclusion. So that's all I'd add and really appreciate the opportunity to talk about this stuff with you. Thanks so much, David. Uh, Laura, over, over to you. I always think of Alina as a hippie, so I'm glad to have it validated now. Um, I'll be really brief. Um, I think the most important thing that people can do, I mean, I agree with everything Alina and David uh, laid out, um, but to me, the most important thing that people can do is participate in the democratic process. The goal of these operations is so often to make us doubt the integrity of the process, to weaken our faith in democracy, to weaken our faith in institutions. And the best retort to that is to double down on those institutions and to participate in whatever way that means for you as an individual. Um, but I think that that's absolutely essential because if we um, allow democracy to be discredited, if we um, allow our faith to be shaken, um, then, then you know, our adversaries win. That doesn't mean democracy doesn't have problems and that we don't need to address all these challenges. But if we don't participate, then we've already lost the battle. I think that's uh, about as good a point uh, to end on as I could imagine. So th thank you very much, Laura. Thank you to uh, David and Alina as well for joining us. Uh, and thank you to our audience uh, for, for uh, taking part today. Uh, it's been a real pleasure to, to have this conversation. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.